I'm growing pan here. So before you go, I'll give you a, a, some, some pans to take back to your, to your parents. Tell the students we trust you and you will know who cheats. Assalamu alaikum, my name is uh, Ali Khan. I am the Dean of the Mushtaq Ahmed Gurmani School of Humanities and Social Sciences. My association with LAMS now goes back almost 15 years. Uh, I've made my way through this uh, wonderful institution. And today I'm going to be asking a series of questions to uh, Sayyid Babar Ali Saab, who of course has been responsible for, for you know, bringing LAMS to, to, to where it is today. So, Babar Saab, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Sure. I'm going to start with the easier ones. Sure. And then I will get on to some more personal ones. Sure, uh, sure. And um, we'll take it that way. So, my first question is really that, um, you know, LUMS began as a business school. Uh, that was where we started. But I have a feeling that right from the start, you wanted your students, even if they were business students, to know about social sciences and humanities. Why, why was that the case? Because uh, having been in business and uh, I only attended the advanced management program at Harvard, which um, was uh, kind of a compressed MBA program. And I realized that um, there was more to it than just running the mechanics of bus doing business, like um, marketing, finance, human relations and all that. You needed other dimensions to it. And we were very keen that the kind of student that would come out of the business school would be different from anybody else that comes out of a normal business school. He should be a good human being, a good citizen, somebody who's sensitive to things other than making money. And that was really our object. And, and we, uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, you must have been told that we used to spend a lot of time talking to students, you know, yes. socializing with them because it was a very small class. There were 35, 40 students. So they could uh, spare the time, we could spare the time. And uh, as it was a, a, a kind of a new baby in the family, we all took, gave a lot of time. I, before, I mean, for instance, uh, I go to office fairly regularly in the morning, but I would stop over at on yes, my way. Yes. In those days, we were near the Liberty Market. So, so this was something which was evolving and we wanted to, um, to do things which other has, others had not done, but which would make our student different. It is about making money, but I mean, how you make a deal, for example, depends a lot about understanding the culture in which you are sure. working. So sure. if you're dealing with say a, a German company or a, a Dutch company or a Japanese company, if you know a little bit about their culture, they are much more, dis, you know, they're predisposed towards being favorable to you. Yeah, no, that, that also, I mean, adds on to it. And luckily in my, uh, right uh, at the beginning of my business career, we uh, had this relationship with the, with the rousing family, you know, yes. which have been big benefactors to LAMS. And uh, the founder of the Rousing family, Mr. Ruben Rousing, after whom the, the center at, uh, at LAMS is named, he was a person who was a very successful businessman, but he never talked business. He was always talking about new things, new ideas, new issues, new problems, uh, not affecting his business, but affecting not even Europe, affecting the world. And uh, so that was something that uh, I was very lucky to have been uh, exposed to his kind of thinking and being young at that time, I tried to um, emulate him in, in my own way of life. Well, I'm, I'm going to move on a little bit about the school. Um, so, you know, from teaching humanities and social science uh, subjects to, to business school students, the school has become the largest school at LUMS and it is probably the preeminent humanities and social science institution in Pakistan. How do you see, how do you view that trajectory for, for the school? I think it's very, very vital uh, because this is kind of, um, I mean, you being a sportsman would know, it's sort of the role of a half line in hockey. You know, they um, feed the forwards and they, uh, you know, support the people who are defending the goal. And they are the, the backbone of, uh, 
of a, uh, of a learning process. And because of the diversity of different subjects that you have in your School of Humanities, and thanks to you and to your colleagues who have always added a new subject or a new topic at that level, it uh, it adds to the learning and to the width of the of of the students' knowledge. Uh, it may not be directly relevant to their major subject, mm. but I have seen uh, and heard from people, not only from Lums but from other universities, that what they really took with them after their studies was something that was a very minor subject like anthropology or, or something with psychology, which uh, they hated to, to, to start with, but they found out that it added to their dimension, which was totally different from other people that they came into contact in life. And I think that um, role your school uh, should continue to play. And, uh, and it should, um, should keep on adding new topics, new subjects, bring in um, specialists, uh, you know, if, even if they are not a full-time faculty member, but if there is somebody with a unique experience, bring him into the into the into the classroom. Only two days ago, I, you know, heard a few of the stanzas of uh, Khaja Farid, who was a Saraiki poet from Multan. He died at the turn of the last century, about 1900, he died. Now, he talked in, in, in Saraiki, uh, I mean, he wrote in Saraiki, but I later, you know, in my probing about him, uh, I asked one of the retired senior bureaucrats who comes from that area, I said, do you know anybody who's a scholar? He said, yes, there's a colleague of mine who's retired and has written a book. He's a retired civil servant. Right and is an authority on Khaja Farid. Now, I will pass his name on to you. Bring him into the classroom yes. because, uh, I mean, I, till a few years ago, never heard of Khaja Farid. I'd always mixed him up with Baba Farid, you know, yes, of Shakar yes. But here was another genius in the Saraiki area. Bring him into the classroom and let the people know how rich this country's at literary heritage. Yes, yes. So these are things which I think we keep on infusing. But I tell you, this is something that in my school days at Aitchison, Mr. Barry was always doing. He was always looking for somebody who was visiting Lahore, who was available in Lahore. And uh, he brought him into the campus. And, um, uh, you know, in those days, we were very few students at Aitchison College. And especially in the senior school, we were hardly 50 students. So he would bring them to, bring us to his house, make us sit on the carpet, and this laminary would come and share his thoughts. And I still remember, uh, he brought in, uh, you know, this was the days when uh, there was uh, talk in the newspapers about, uh, about uh, segregation in America, you know, the yes. Jim Crow and all that kind of thing. So he brought Professor Rice, who was the principal of FC College. And we later on discovered that Mrs. Rice was the sister of the Compton brothers. These were scientists. One of them was a Nobel laureate in physics. The other was um, in charge of the Manhattan Project, you know, which produced the bomb. Right. So these were people, and so Mrs. Rice was there, and Mr. Rice was trying to defend the American <laughs> way of life. So, so it was, so it was one of those things that I picked up at Eastern College. That let's get hold of somebody who would come and talk to the students, uh, who they would normally not run into. And I think you should keep on looking for such visitors or such people who are, sit, you know, living a retired life. Bring them out, and you are helping those people really In to uh, to revive their interest in life. Okay, um, historically in our part of the world, humanities and social sciences has been really a neglected option for students, but even more so for parents. Parents always say, you know, engineering or, or, or medical science. Um, so it's not really been a career choice. But if you look at graduates from our school, they have performed so outstandingly in a variety of fields, um, filmmaking, uh, multinational companies, 
CSS. Why do you think that that has been the case? Well, I think it, 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 I think it's the, the width and the depth of the subjects that you teach them. And I think the environment in your school is one of learning, not of getting grades and scoring points. Uh, I think that is uh, very vital in, um, in learning. Uh, today I was uh, you know, listening to a TED talk where um, this lady was a champion um, sports um, trainer in, in California and she got all the laurels of the world, uh, you know, while she was there training, she said the best trainer uh, uh, and all that. But she said that on reflecting, the way the people compete for a position in a, in, in a, in a competition, it, it destroys your inner soul. And he says, I've seen too many people who are gold medalists, who are exceptional in studies, that they are damaged from inside. And he said, we need people who are normal uh, and, 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 and take, you know, develop themselves in a, in a, in a, in a manner that they, they remain undamaged inside. I think this is, and I, your school plays a big important role because you've got so many societies and you also, because of your interest in uh, physical activities, you create a, a, a link between the classroom and the playground. And that again is a very important thing. Uh, as you know, I mean, yes. Battle of Waterloo was one of the playing fields yes. of Eaton and Harrow. So there, there again, you know, that it's not the individual, it's the, the team. Uh, and the, your group of people that you work with, your friends, that um, that help you achieve whatever you want to do. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, something a little bit more personal. Now, I, I know that you have a deep interest in, in, in Islam, in a very inclusive manner. Our school has always strived to follow a comprehensive, diverse and in, inclusive view of, of, of Islam, and that's what we've been teaching. Where did you gain your knowledge of religion and Islam? I read the Quran, uh, which was mandatory, um, not at an early age. I did it when I was in my BA class. Okay. I realized that there was something that was missing in my, uh, you know, learning or whatever it was. And I got hold of a Malvi and uh, within six months I was able to uh, read through the Quran. And then um, later on, um, you know, for the last 25 years, I've been spending my summers abroad. And during that period, I take the opportunity of uh, reading the, not the, only the Quran, but its translation also. So this is something that I, but parallel to that, I have been um, a student of, um, of Saadi and of um, Rumi and Iqbal. And I would say that 75% of Iqbal's poetry, you know, hovers around Islam. It's Islamic history, is, uh, quotations from the Quran and things like that. And so I've been sort of talking to you and to your colleagues that in your classes of Islamiyat, you don't have to tell them that so-and-so was born in this year and died in that year and, you know, how many battles they fought. That's not important. but teach them what really Quran means, what Islam means. Islam is a way of life. Islam is a way of conducting yourself in a manner that you are not only happy with yourself, you make others happy. It's, it's the most egalitarian uh, religion that there is. And it's a, very, um, it's a very supportive religion. It's a very simple religion. It's not a dogma that is, uh, you have to follow through through the, it doesn't sort of, you don't have to go to a priest or to a, to a, to a Malvi or to a Pandit or to a, mm. you know, you pick up the book and you develop your own love for your religion and your own devotion or whatever it is. It's a direct link between you and your maker. To be a Hafiz of Quran and to cheat in the classroom, Yes. You know, that is, is not on. <laughs> so yes. your everyday conduct should be such that uh, you display your, your uh, commitment. Uh, I mean, Islam is a way of life. It's, uh, 
is something that uh, you don't have to carry it on your shoulder, but it's a way of of conducting yourself in a normal manner. It makes you a happier man. It makes you a, a good person to be uh, to be helpful, to be sympathetic, uh, to be modest, humble. Basic human values yes. that we should all have. Yeah. That is a Muslim. Yes. Okay, so one of the defining features of, uh, of our school, the Gurmani school, is that it has a very balanced gender ratio. Yes. Not only in terms of the students, because we have a lot of female students, probably more than the male students, but also in the faculty. So we have a very balanced ratio there as well. How important are the achievements of women in the school and in Pakistan in general for you? I mean, I would say that this is uh, you um, are, are certainly um, uh, leading the way and being uh, and not pioneering this um, uh, this effort to prove to the world that our women are as good, if not better, than the men. And they need to be recognized. They need to be uh, to be uh, celebrated. They need to be applauded, and they need to be rewarded. So, uh, and I am sure. I hope uh, one day the dean uh, sitting in your place will be a lady. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, and I tell you that certain initiatives that uh, that uh, you and your colleagues have taken, for instance, in the business school, uh, Al Noor came up with the idea. He said. Why don't you, in the MBA class, uh, reduce the fees by half for women? women? And that immediately had an impact of more girls going into MBA, which means they'll go more into business. Yes. And, uh, and, and that again, today we in the business world, we are looking for women that can be recognized, promoted, given responsibility. And hopefully within 10 years, you will have a whole stream of good uh, women coming up with uh, you know knowledge about business management so these are things which uh, need to be done uh, in the school of science and engineering where uh, i spend fair amount of my time on the campus much to the annoyance of some of the <laughs> other deans <laughs> is uh, that uh, especially in subjects like biology is totally dominated by women and um, and they have made a mark not only here but abroad and uh, and it's it's a wonderful feeling. Um, I uh, you know have been visiting some of the medical colleges uh, uh, around Lahore, and uh, though you know, and I find that uh, majority of the students are women in medical colleges. Yes, yes. But the sad part is that they go pick up this profession not to practice but to get find a good match. And uh, over 50% of the women that go to the medical college get married and, and that's the end of their knowledge. And I keep on telling them, I said, raise a family, get married, come back to the profession yes. because this is very important. Yes. Because if you are studying in a medical college and your parents are paying a very high fee, you are taking somebody else's place who wants to be a doctor forever. So this is not fair and we need to inculcate and I think the of all the girls that have graduated from from LUMS, uh, I mean, in touch with many of them, and I would say the it, it will be less than ten percent who are not working. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes, and uh, that and that is very good. And I hope when you go into the classroom, you 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 guide them that we are not against your getting married, raising a family. You can go back to work today. We welcome women who have settled down their lives, their kids have gone to school and they, they want to come back to work and, and they are people, they are, you know, people with experience, with maturity and with responsibility. Yes. And we need to uh, make sure that women are not left behind in, um, in uh, whatever leadership programs that they are, whether they are in the civil service or in the in um, in education, education particularly, I think they make very good teachers. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think that's that's absolutely right. Okay, um, when we launched our history major, I remember that you are amongst the most supportive of of, of the people of the management committee um, about the major. Now, for someone who has seen Pakistan's history unfold 
in front of their eyes. I want you to know what was your enduring memory of partition? You know, I was uh, not here uh, during the time of, uh, during 1947, I was away in America. Uh, but certainly I was very much, uh, in I was, I had graduated already from Punjab University in 1945. So, and 1940 onwards, you know, I was 16 years old, at the t uh, uh, 14 years at the time of uh, the Pakistan resolution when the name Pakistan right. emerged on the political scene. So as a young student, I was, uh, you know, very enthused about it and, and all that. So, and because of the family relationship with the leading personalities, especially the Muslims of India, not only just Punjab, but elsewhere, uh, one could, um, you know, one was aware of what was happening and uh, one could see the 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 changing uh, political scene in india where the british at one time there was no talk of any independence you know the the maximum that congress would was asking for the dominion status which meant that you want to be wanted to be on yes. par with canada or australia or south africa there was no question of being independent and so these uh, political things uh, were being um, were being talked about and discussed in the in the newspapers. Mind you, at HSN we were not taught Indian history at all. Right. We were taught uh, the history of uh, you know North America or, or English history and things like that. I don't know why it was a part of their you know British strategy of of grooming these youngsters who'd yes. be always loyal to the British. Yes like the Mio College in, in Ajmer and others. So, so to me, um, and I was very lucky, one of my, my, my favorite teacher, Edson, was uh, Victor Kernan, and he was a historian. So he sort of uh, used to, you know, talk about history, a fair amount of history, and he, he was a walking encyclopedia of history of the world, I mean, mm. and wrote some very interesting books. Uh, on different subjects which uh, totally exposed the exploitation by the British. You know, he was a card-carrying communist. Right. <laughs> and um, so I he, I kept in touch with him after he left HSN and went back to England. He was a fellow at Trinity College before he came out to, to India at the uh, beginning of the war. And uh, then Cambridge wouldn't touch him because they knew about his right, political his, leaning. Yes. Then uh, Edinburgh offered him a place. And of course, he retired from there. But I kept in touch with him till he died. And about 15 years ago, he lived, uh, he retired in a place called Stow on the borders between you know, Scotland and, and England. And he had a pr profound uh, sort of interest, uh, Im impression on me, how important history was in um, your uh, your learning uh, and of course um, we always blame the politicians that they never learn anything from history but certainly somebody who's a student of history has seen how often countries and leadership in countries make mistakes by not looking at what happened in the past and what was the the fate of the people who you know did certain things and they keep on repeating that yes yes I'm so happy that you have history and I hope there are no, no, uh, no bars on whatever history you teach them. Not at all. Not at all. We, we, we you know, no borders. No yeah, borders. that's very important, especially the history of now in India. They, a lot is coming out of what the British have suppressed. Yes, yes. You know, Dalimpal has done a fair amount of work, and, but a lot of Indians have un, have started yes. digging out history. Luckily, the Indian, uh, the uh, the British. Uh, record keeping in the India Office Library. There's a lot of material uh, that um, is uh, could be available, which is very damaging to the British own conduct. You know, surprisingly, uh, some of the countries never sort of try and um, hide their their uh, skeletons. Um, I have recently, well, a few years ago, read biography of Stalin and this was written by either an Englishman or an American based on archives from the Kremlin 
you know, and they they recorded everything that he did, including his last moments of life, where um, he was ill, and um, no doctor would go near him. He was shouting and screaming and you know making all kinds of noises because they said that if he survives, he'll kill us all. But they kept record of it. So uh, I hope um, uh, you know the tragedy in this country is that Ziaul Haq tried to uh, wipe to out. wipe out history and uh, and I hope somebody has recorded it and put it somewhere that it can be done. I hope the the people in Bangladesh should have it. Uh, we should we should try and you know you should you should connect yourself to the historians of Bangladesh yes. and find out. What, how they look at Pakistan Absolutely. from their point of view, and we should see if we can reconcile the two in the sense that two sides of the same page. Yes, yes. Instead of maligning each other, we should learn from each other to see that never should this happen ever again. And uh, no, Zayul Haq did a lot of damage to this country's um, record keeping. I mean, he even destroyed the records of Qaid's own. Personal diary, uh, you know. Uh, you know, he tried to influence Walpert to yes. change the text of his yes, book. Yes, I remember. And I remember I, a friend of mine who was in the um, Pakistan embassy in Washington. He was sent as as an emissary to to Los Angeles to talk to to Walpert and tell him that we will buy so many books if you would take away a few sentences of your book. He said, "I'm sorry, I can't do it." I had the privilege of meeting Walpert. Yes. Uh, I, there was a friend of mine who had worked with me, but who retired and lived in Los Angeles. And um, he took me to Walpert because he was literati. He was interested in uh, uh, writing and things like that. And uh, so I met Walpert and I said, what made you write about Jinnah? And he said um, he had done a study of Gokhale. Right, right. And, uh, and he said, I was waiting for, because he said in Gokhale's life, this man kept on propping up. He was a very important member of Gokhale's team, yes. uh, or his, uh, you know, either his uh, member of the team or somebody who was always working with him. And and I said I was waiting for ten years to somebody pick up this character, and write a book, and then he said, when I saw nobody do it, I picked it up myself and wrote it on my own. This is this is uh, Walper telling me, yes. and uh, so so I was very lucky. He died two years ago. Yes, yes, yes. that's a fascinating story. Uh, I mean, it leads on to my next question very nicely. So, you know, a few years ago, both our departments, economics and humanities and social sciences, had conferences that were based on regional issues. And we had participants coming from all over the region, including Bangladesh, including Nepal, including India as well. I think one of the biggest challenges that we face today in this region is how to bring an enduring peace to it so that our people can all prosper. But the last few years has been very difficult. Uh, our relations with Bangladesh have suffered. Our relations with India have suffered. And I know that you've been involved in regional issues, it's been something very close to your heart. And I wonder, what is your vision for South Asia's future? You know, as I mentioned to you earlier on, I grew up uh, before partition. So my, you know, I have no bias against people who are non-Muslims. You know, I grew up with them. I, my closest friend was a Sikh. Yes. You know, you can change history, you can't change geography. You, we have to live with each other in harmony and there is so much good that can come out by being friendly, uh, not only politically, economically, socially, uh, literally, you know, in, uh, our, uh, you know, we should have um, exchange of students, exchange yes. of faculty in the, in the academic world. So I have um, constantly been working on it and as recent as three months ago, a friend of mine who, uh, the Pakistani who is a British citizen, all of a sudden she sent me a message that I'm in Delhi. 
and uh, I've come here to attend a friend's wedding. She lives in London. And you might know her, uh, Nasreen. Uh, her sister is Chini, you know this. Yes, yes, I know, yes. Uh, so she said, and I said, well, while you're in Delhi, can you trace two of my friends there? Yes. Um, one is um, Mushkun Dube, yes. who retired as the um, Foreign Secretary of, uh, of India. And the other was, again, uh, retired, uh, is um, Salman Haider. Yes. And sure enough, I said, you send me their telephone numbers. I called them up and I tell you, they were so thrilled, thrilled yes. and so happy. And they said, wonderful to, and their wives came on to the yes, telephone yes, and yes. to join. So, I mean, there is no rancor. Uh, you know, I mean, what Moody is talking about, I, I would say the in intelligence in India is, is not subscribing to that. It's a lovely story, you know, actually. And, and, and we, uh, you know, uh, about 20 years ago, a very good friend of uh, your father and myself, Rafiuddin, he, he was based in the, uh, the, he was shaft cabinet to the Secretary General at the UN. So he thought of setting up a South Asia Center for Economic Cooperation. And uh, we had a meeting in Dhaka. And uh, so he provided seed fund from the United Nations. And then Ford Foundation came in and SASEP was set up as an organization. Uh, and we said, all right, let's have it in, 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 in Dhaka. And then the Indians offered, they said, we, we can give you hospitality in India. Why don't you move it to there? So we moved it to, I said, fine. So what, they said, what about Pakistan? I said, no, the CID will be chasing you all the time. You have it here. I'll come over. And our people are very narrow minded on this issue. So you have it. So we, uh, we, you know, got that going, but that the Indian government said that any money that we got as international support for this organization should come through the government of India, which we are not prepared to do. We said it has to have its independent status like any other NGO in India. So then we moved it back to Dhaka. And then the, the Bangladesh government also got the Indian sort of right. this thing. So then we, one of our members was from Nepal. So he said, Kathmandu is willing to. So we moved it to Kathmandu. And we were in Kathmandu for about five years. And I ended up as the head of this institute. And we all met regularly. Um, we had uh, top Indian, uh, not only uh, retired bureaucrats, but serving people like, um, uh, well, Mushkun Dube was there, but then we had um, uh, uh, we had a Bengali gentleman who was head of the Indian Planning Commission. He was there with us. And then, of course, head of Planning Commission from Sri Lanka. And then, of course, uh, Rahman Subhan from, right. from Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Akmal Hussain and myself were from, from Pakistan. So we worked and then we just ran out of money. And so it was folded up. But the, the, uh, our, 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 our uh, ambition and our love has not dried up. Hopefully, one day we can revive it. Revive it. Okay, I mean, coming back to education a little bit. Education is about acquiring knowledge. It's about always, you know, wanting to learn something new. And whenever I speak to you, I learn something new. And I'm just wondering how you've kept that spirit of, of wanting to learn alive all this time. So many people give up on it. Yeah, I mean, when you give up, you are dead. Mm. So I don't want to die before <laughs> I die. I'm dead. <laughs> and the only way to uh, keep alive is to to keep me, me inquisitive. For instance, you know, for six months I have not left this compound. Yes. And every hour, every hour, every day for one hour from 11 to 12, I have a, a young man who is very well educated who runs a nursery of plants. So he comes and talks to me about flowers, uh, and and uh, and and plants and trees, and so I, so you'd be happy to know, and you can pass it on to your parents. <laughs> I'm growing pan here. So before you go, I'll give you a I love it, some yes. some pans yes, to take yes, back yes, to I, your yes. to your parents. Yes. So and it's not difficult at all. So he, uh, this friend of mine, brought me four different plants, which we have planted, and each one has taken root, and we have more pans that we can eat. 
<laughs> so, I mean, there are small things like that, but it's, it's very thrilling. And uh, so there is, you know, it reminds me of uh, the story that I heard many years ago. I was very keen on riding and I used to have horses and, and all that. And even at that time, you know, my uh, groom told me the story. He, he, was, a, he was from, from UP in India, he spoke uh, Purbi. And he said, uh, there is an old saying that a man was massaging his horse. And somebody said, what are you doing? So he told him, he said, Saisi ilm daryast, to, to look after a horse is like, it's a, you need an ocean of knowledge yes, to, look, yes. to, to even massage your, <laughs> your horse. So there is so much to be learned even with, from petty, uh, you know, what you think is, is a petty subject. But uh, so much uh, to be to be to be to be to be learned. So and that has has kept me alive. And uh, so I mean, this morning I um, you know saw this TED talk. I told you about this girl who was a champion uh, uh, gymnast uh, teacher. That uh, she said you know to to win medals is, is very glorious outside, but to damage inside. She she, she said I've seen tens of people like this. So this is something, and I think I have forwarded that to you also. Yes, yes, I've got it. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yes. So these are things that you need to tell the students that don't worry about grades. Yes. Worry about what you learn. Now, um, question a little bit off center. So we have a course that is taught in, in, in our school. It's called Food and Culture. And I know one of your great delights is, is food and food preparation and cooking. And I know that my grandmother and you would often exchange uh, ideas on that. Where did that come from? From my mother. She was, um, uh, I didn't see her cook anything, but she was always directing the, the lady who was cooking food for us. And she told, you know, she was always coming out with things that added to your knowledge. For instance, yes, yes. you know, uh, during winter we eat river fish. And she always said, when you're buying river fish, you should always buy fish, which is at least four kilos in weight. Because at that age, the bone structure is much bigger. So you don't worry about small right, bones right, in the fish. Right. So these are small things that, uh, uh, you know, you picked up uh, just by listening to her. Yes. And uh, she always said that, uh, never eat stale food. You know, if you can't afford meat every day, dal khao lekin usi din ke paki hoi khao, kal ke paki na khao. These are things, you know, people read in the fridge or on the deep freeze and all. She was very averse to this. And uh, and she was always um, very keen that um, we have, a, you know, seasonal vegetables. Not, you know, you don't want to eat okra during winter, you want to eat right. it in the summer, you right. want to eat uh, turnips in winter and not in summer. So those things, uh, she said, har cheez mosni khao, don't... And that's what everyone is doing now. Yeah, yeah, now because you have to do it. But I'm saying that this interest in, in food came from her. My father was was not at all interested in food. Right. right but right. these three, four months, I have been taking a lot of interest and I will... Uh, I will inflict some of my the, my uh, new experiments uh, on you. Okay, lovely. I'd love, <laughs> I'd love to be a guinea pig for yeah. that. So having said that education is about acquiring knowledge, I should also say that, you know, I mean, we believe it also involves the inculcation of certain values and ethics and, and morals. There are entire disciplines that are, are, are concerned with this. Philosophy looks at ethics, for example. But I know this is something that is actually very close to your heart. How important are those values in today's world where we are beset by fake news and, and lies and, and deceit? I think it's much, more value, it's much more important today than it was in the past. La Ten days ago, a very good friend of mine who retired uh, as a very senior bureaucrat, he retired as chairman of OPTA. He's a Pathan by the name of uh, Shakil Durani. Very fine gentleman. He came from the CSP Carter. He, he came in, sort of, we were discussing this thing. He said one of the finest people, human beings that he ever met was a German lady who ran 
the leper colony in Cal in Karachi. Yes, of course. Yes. She died recently. Yes, yes. He said, I got to know her, I used to visit her. And he persuaded her to start a, a, a minor camp in the frontier for the lepers. And he said, I asked her that you've been here for 50 years. What do you think is wrong with the Pakistanis? And she said it in one word. They don't speak the truth. You know, if you try and analyze that, and if you are truthful, and this is something, you know, nobody talks about it. We always talk about Quran and Hadith and Shara and everything else. And there is nothing more emphasized in the Quran, Pura Tolo, it means be fair, be truthful. And this is something, and I've been talking to you and to your colleagues, that why don't we take away invigilators in your examination? Tell the students we trust you. And you will know who cheats. And you can shame them. Their own colleagues will shame them. And, you know, teach them that life is all about being on the straight and narrow path. And people who are really successful in life are people who are truthful. I mean, why was the prophet chosen to be the prophet? Only on one thing. He was Amin. He was non-lettered. He could read or write. But still, God chose him to bring a new religion into this world because only of one factor. So this is something that we need to tell our students that each, and this is something which is in your control. You don't have to borrow it from anybody else. Your own conscience is there to tell you from inside. Yes. So I think this is something that you need to drive home. And, you know, I keep on telling students that I meet in the classroom. And some of them said, what, what, do, you, what do you expect of a, of a boy or a girl coming out of, out of lumps? Ye jhootni bolega. Ye jhootni bolegi. To me, that is the best qualification or certificate you can get. And of course, while you are, you have them with you for four years, you know, most of their habits have been picked up earlier on. Yes. And the tragedy is, which I've already talked in my earlier discussions, is that today the parents have totally abdicated their responsibility. They said, send him to an expensive or her to an expensive school and we've done our duty. She goes to a coffee party, she has no time for her kids. And that's not the way to ring up children. I mean, you have a daughter, you know how much it takes to, to bring up one child. And you can see the dividend. And this is something that we need to do this. We just don't want to be a a, a, a factory to produce people with, you know, nerds or, or with high qualification and degree. They can, we want people who can read, write, speak and be honest. I think that's a tremendous. I mean, if you look around you, if we had people with that quality among your businessmen, about your politicians, about your bureaucrats, you would be in another, in another heaven altogether as a nation. Baba Sahib, you've had many influences in your life. But even in our conversation right now, you brought up several times the influence of your early teachers, HSN, elsewhere. What, I mean, what made them the teachers that they are? I tell you, um, they were tutors as well as teachers. You know, in, 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 in the Urdu, uh, you know, vocabulary, you have Ustad and Atalik. They were there to, to watch, uh, help, mentor, guide, love, 
so that you could become a better person than the teacher themselves. Right, right, right. And this is something that you need to inculcate in your colleagues, that your success is that your students have to be better than you. And that is so rewarding that to see somebody, you know, nurturing a, I'm sitting in the plant, you know, in the garden here, you plant a seed and you see that thing grow out of the ground and then you see it flower. I mean, you see that beautiful hibiscus flower. Yes, yes. It yes. only flowered last night and I've been coming and watching it, you see. So, I mean, that kind of satisfaction you get when you see your students, you know, prosper and bloom like that. It's the personality, it's their character, it's their way to help somebody to, to and, and, and they must get into the habit of giving. Giving is not money. Giving time, giving love, giving ideas, helping others to stand on their feet. I think that is a tremendously important thing. Another thing that you could start uh, in your school is, is pair up the, the brighter students with the weaker ones. Right. And tell him, we, you will be rewarded to make sure that this person's grades go from X to Y. And you know, I mean, known better than I do, that you learn more by teaching than by, by yes. le learning. And another thing that uh, I've often shared with many of my um, people from, uh, from the academic world, you know, some of the teachers that even I came across during my mature life, especially at the Harvard Business School, there was a gentleman, I don't know whether you all came across him, Jim Austin, he was the man with the beard. He, um, he, he was helping us with uh, the, uh, you know, curricula and the setup of the business school, Jim Austin. He, he retired now, he's gone to Mexico and he's become a farmer. Okay. <laughs> so I, whenever I went to Boston, I used to visit him. And he had a reminder to himself written on his exit door. Have you helped any student today? That was his reminder that my job here is to do that. To do that. And I think this is something that you need to inculcate in your faculty that being a faculty member, it's a tremendous responsibility. They are creating the next generation. And uh, what Lambs is going to be 20 years or 30 years from now will depend on what is happening in the classroom today. Okay. Um, you know, the current economic climate is, is encouraging many people outside of academia to look at the university's impact in quite narrow terms, in utilitarian terms, concentrating on, only on economic benefit, particularly to the individual student. But Humanities and social sciences focuses on creating individuals that bring about change in society. That is what our goal should be. And I was wondering, do you think that that is what universities should be trying to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, not long ago, uh, maybe two or three years ago, um, I was sort of talking to some people at, at Harvard and they said, you know, there is no substitute of rubbing of the minds, which happens only in an academic environment. New ideas come in, new thoughts generate, new discoveries come out. And that is something that you are doing it. Because not long ago, you sent me a, sent me a list of the students Graduate. who have gone out into the world to do PhD and various other things. No, you have more than a hundred students uh, of your alumni who are in the civil service today. Yes. I tell you, in 20 years time, they are going to make a difference in the country's administration. My plea to you is, once a year, bring them back to the campus. Have a day to celebrate our civil servants and learn from them what they picked up, what should be telling our students which they did not learn here and how we can get more students to go into the civil service. Uh, I think that will be a great service and 
bring them back because you need to celebrate these people. They are, you know, uh, on the front line. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm repeating something that I mentioned the other day that uh, last week I wrote to Nuzad. I said, give me a list of the students who uh, my foundation supported for their NOP program. Yes. So she sent me a list of 100 students of whom 70, 70 have already graduated, five dropped out and 25 are on the campus today in the four years. And, she, and I asked her to send me their email addresses. So she, she sent me the email addresses and I said, I, I want to keep in touch with you. Tell me when you were at LAMS, what did you do? And where are you now? Because I want to celebrate your success. Yes. And within the first one week, I got five replies. Uh, the first one came from a fellow. He said, I've just completed my PhD at UT Austin. Uh, I'm a uh, graduate from the uh, science school. I've joined Google. The second one was a fellow. He said, I come from a small, small village in KPK. And I, after lumps, I joined the civil, the provincial service of, uh, of the frontier and I prepared for the senior services examination. I've got in, I'm now in the foreign service, I've, I've opted for the foreign service. Somebody from a small village. And the third one was, he said, I come from a village in Skardu and I am now in the foreign exchange department of the State Bank of Pakistan and I've never enjoyed my job so much. <laughs> and the last one, the fifth one, is a girl, she said, uh, after my accounting and um, finance major, I joined Price Waterhouse in, in, yes. in, in England. I've completed my five years, I've got my British passport, and now I'm looking for a bigger job than Price Waterhouse. Okay. I mean, that's, that's incredible. music to your ears. Yes, yes. So this is something that we should continue to do that. You know, they are shy of to, you know, to, to get back to you. You have to reach out to them. Yes, yes. And tell them that they are the future of Lums. And we should celebrate them. I'm reminded of something that a former vice chancellor of, of, of Cambridge said. He said that, you know, modern medical science has allowed us humankind to live to a hundred and beyond. But what use is living so long if you don't have the arts and humanities? Correct. And, you know, in the last eight months since we've had this COVID, we've all been shut up. We've all been within a certain area. And in this time, so many people have turned to music, film, literature. This is what we've turned to in order to keep us going. I was wondering, you know, how you have experienced the last Same six thing. months. I've been studying Iqbal every day, reading about Punjabi poets, you know, on the, on the YouTube, you have fantastic collection of, uh, and also music. Yes. You know, uh, music from mostly Eastern music. Yes. yes. Uh, both vocal as well as instrumental. There is a whole ocean of information available, so long as you have the desire to enjoy it. Yes. And I've been very lucky. I've been reading. And of course, I'm not reading much, but I'm listening more. Okay. But also talking to people. Yes. Yes. And the gardening. Gardening, of course. Gardening, uh, cooking. Yes. Yes. So these are things that... Uh, Absolutely. See you through. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We've missed out one very important part of, of education, which you and I often talk about and which I know that has been a very important part of your life. A healthy body is a healthy mind. Sure. And sure. more and more, we've been trying to bring physical education into our curriculum. What are your views about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, luckily I went to Asian College from the age of eight until today. I exercise every day. Yes. You know, I mean, here, even in this confined environment, till about three days ago, I was walking 4,000 steps every day. And, uh, you know, I've been swimming, I've been playing water polo, tennis, polo, uh, bad cricket, 
uh, but uh, poor squash. But I've, uh, you know, dabbled in all these um, various physical activities. And, um, and I didn't realize how important it was physical exercise when I had about 10 years ago, I had both my knees uh, replaced. Uh, I was in a hospital in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was in the ICU after each uh, surgery for about three days and then moved to what they call the rehab center where you had one nurse looking after five or six people. And, uh, and every day you had to get out of your bed and you, they made you walk and all that. And I saw an elderly person sitting at the nursing station. He looked very, you know, educated by his looks, a uh, 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 white American doctor. So I walked up to him and I said, uh, may I know who you are? And he said, I'm so-and-so, I'm a retired doctor. And instead of sitting at home, yes. uh, I have volunteered to come and help these nurses look after their patients. And he said, I'm glad that you're walking. Do you know that if you lie on your bed for four days, all your muscles disappear? So this came as a shock to me that, it, you know, so now you look back and say, elderly people who lie down yes. and they say, no, I can't get out of my bed. They don't realize that all their muscles have disappeared because they didn't get up. So I totally subscribe to the fact that you got to keep on moving. Yes. And um, a healthy mind and a healthy body go together. You can't separate the two. Yes. Okay, so my, my final question. You've traveled the world. I think you've probably been on every continent. If I was to ask you to pick one country which you admired most, maybe for its education system, maybe for some other reason, which one would it be? Well, one would be Pakistan because, I mean, this is something that you can't take yourself away from here. The other country that I loved a lot was India. Because I traveled in India and India is not one country, it's many countries. Each, what they call the state today or each province had its own culture, its own food, its own language, its own, uh, you know. And today, you know, one feels so hurt yes. that a country that you held up in your mind as somebody that that country that you wanted you know the only country that i wanted to go as an ambassador was india but today one doesn't want to do that but a country i i would say the scandinavian countries are very very uh, very interesting because they are small yes. full of local culture design food people with um, no uh, with a lot of Modesty, not humility, but modesty. They don't brag about themselves. And of the Scandinavian countries, the one that I liked most was Finland. Maybe it was a girl that I fell in love with. <laughs> <laughs> Your she wife is sitting behind no, you. No, she knows moment. about it. <laughs> she, but this is long before uh, we, we. But uh, this was. Uh, but even Finland, I mean, has beautiful design. You know, they produce some of the best architects of the world. The, uh, uh, you know, Alva Ato and uh, the Saranen. Yes. The father and the son and all yes. that. Their food, their way of life, their weather. Of course, their winter is very severe. But, uh, but I, I would say Sweden is equally good. We had beautiful, lovely friends there and still have. So I would say that, but uh, America is very, I mean, I'm keen to go there because my granddaughter is there and I have a lot of friends there. But America is, um, you don't, you can take everything for granted there. There's nothing that, that you can say, ah, what beautiful things are there. Right. It's all borrowed right. from right. elsewhere. Right. But I forgot to ask one and I'm going to ask it regardless because it came up as you were talking. We live in a very globalized world now. Our culture is globalized. We watch similar programs wherever we are, etc. But I know that you are, you know, you are, you are very keen on the fact that our students should know their own 
literature, their own history and their own culture. How important are those things in a world which is now so globalized? I think they are more important today than ever because if they get sort of sucked into the international literature, international music, you know, I mean, you know it better than I do that, you know, we have a whole world of our own music and if you are, if you're not immersed in it, you, you are much poorer. Yes. Same with your literature, your Punjabi literature, your Pashto literature, your Sindhi literature, your Urdu literature. Those are things that and we as, as enablers at university have to certainly expose the kids to these opportunities. You can't take everybody to drink the water, but take them to the water. Yes. Show them that this is something. I mean, I, you run a very good program of taking your students up in the northern areas. Yes. I mean, those are wonders of the world, which very few countries are fortunate to have. And I hope some of your students will end up working in those areas. You know, we have a fairly large representation of people from northern areas yes, on your campus yes, yes. over the years. And today, the head of the Khan Foundation in Islamabad is a Lam graduate. So we, we need to, to celebrate our own country. I hope we can get, you know, people from Balochistan also to... to that Balochistan again has some very beautiful areas to, to look and admire. So does Sin. Yes. You know, their, their, their third desert is so full of history and yes, culture, yes. their music. Somebody sent me a, 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 a clip of, of music, a, plus, a person playing something like a castnet yes, in yes, the Thar Park yes, area. Yes. So there is, there is so much to be admired. It doesn't mean that you should not know what is happening in the Vienna Philharmonic, but don't forget that there is, there is there's something to be learned here. Your al Ghoza players. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's a unique instrument. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I hope this was wonderful. not not boring. It, it, not at all. It was a wonderful, uh, you know, opportunity for me again to learn. I hope many of your lawyers that are you graduating are women also. Absolutely, I think we've had almost a steadily 50-50. Oh, excellent, uh, excellent. This is where, but so. make sure that they don't get married and sit at home. 